Welcome to our program, Asia's Challenge, Ensuring Sustainable Growth. And we're honored to have with us this evening Rajat Nag, Managing Director General, excuse me, Managing Director General of the Asian Development Bank, in conversation with David Arnold, President of the Asia Foundation. My name is Carla Thorson, and I'm Vice President for Public Programs here at the World Affairs Council. Now, the World Affairs Council offers a neutral forum on critical international issues and opportunities. And to learn more about the Council or to hear our programs or join our membership, please do visit our website, worldaffairs.org. And I also just would like to make a special note that registration for our annual conference, World Affairs 2013, <coughs> opens on December 1st. And so we are delighted to share with you the initial announcements for the conference. It's going to take place on March 7th and 8th in the spring. And several of the sessions will be focused on Asia's shifting economic and political landscape. So I hope that you will all take an interest in attending the conference. Tonight's program is being recorded for radio, and we'd like to thank our audio engineer, Jane Heaven. And for that reason, I'd also like to ask you to take a moment to turn off any cell phones, anything that might go beep during the program, speakers included. <laughs> and while you're doing that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening. David Arnold is president of the Asia Foundation, an international development organization based here in San Francisco. A development and governance expert, David is also a trustee of the World Affairs Council. Before joining the Asia Foundation, he served as president of the American University in Cairo, and in fact came here as a speaker in that role. And as the executive vice president of the Institute of International Education, he spent more than a decade at the Ford Foundation, serving in several posts in South Asia. So please join me in welcoming David Arnold, who will introduce our speaker. Well, thanks very much, Carla. It's a great pleasure uh, for me to welcome all of you to this um, evening's program, which, as Carla mentioned, is entitled uh, Asia's Challenge, Ensuring Sustainable Growth. I think all of us are aware that um, the major economies of Asia have been experiencing unprecedented growth over the recent decades. And as a result, we've seen significant achievements in terms of reducing poverty, and creating a rising middle class in countries like China and India. Several previously poor Asian countries are now gaining middle income status, and the rest of the world is very much dependent on Asia's continued growth to help fuel the global economy. But Asia's growth story masks daunting challenges. The region's economic and industrial advancement is placing increased pressure on the region's natural resource and environment uh, base. And we're also seeing widening income disparities that pose a threat to Asia's continued growth and development. The Asian Development Bank is committed to helping developing member countries evolve into thriving modern economies that are well integrated with each other and with the world. And the ADB invests in infrastructure programs and financial and public administration systems, efforts to improve governance and promote en environmental, uh, environmentally responsible development, um, and really helping to prepare nations for the impact of global climate change and to better manage their natural resources. The main devices of ADB assistance are loans, grants, policy dialogue, technical assistance, and equity investments. We at the Asia Foundation have had a long history of collaboration with the Asian Development Bank. And in fact, last week I had the uh, pleasure of, and opportunity of visiting with our speaker at the ADB headquarters in Manila, where AD ADB is, uh, is based. Our speaker this evening, uh, as mentioned, uh, serves in a very crucially important role there as the Managing Director General. And in that role, Rajat uh, Nag has um, 
had wide-ranging responsibilities uh, for many of the issues and challenges that relevant to Asia's development that he'll be speaking about this evening. Um, Rajat, in fact, has uh, been a, a member of the a ADB staff for uh, more than two decades. He's traveled across Asia working on a range of projects, including infrastructure financing, public-private partnerships, and regional economic integration. His particular interest is in working to bridge the gap between the region's thriving economies and millions of poor people that are being left behind. He began his professional career at the Bank of Canada um, and holds engineering degrees from the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi and the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. He also obtained master's degrees in business administration uh, from the University of Saskatchewan and an MA in economics from the London School of Economics. Um, in a moment, I'm going to turn the floor over to Rajat, and he uh, will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, following which we'll have an opportunity for an open, what we're referring to as a fireside chat, which sounds appropriate on a cold, drizzly, dreary uh, evening like tonight in San Francisco. But um, on your seats, you will see uh, blue cards, and I invite you to uh, jot any questions that you would like to have posed to our speaker. But in the meantime, I would invite you to please join me in welcoming our uh, distinguished speaker this evening, uh, Rajat Nag. Thank you very much, David, for that very warm welcome. Thank you, Carla, for giving me this opportunity of speaking here. Uh, our more sincere thanks to the Asia Foundation and the World Affairs Council for making this evening possible for us. A uh, great opportunity for us to come from Manila and have an audience with this great interest, obviously, in this topic. Uh, Asia has gone through a very significant transformation in the last four decades, uh, and a transformation which is remarkable. Uh, in 1970, uh, one in every two Asians uh, lived on less than a dollar a day. Uh, by 1990, that figure had come down to one in every three, and by 2005, uh, it was down to one in five. Uh, Asia managed to achieve in one generation 40 years, what in some other parts of the world have taken 100 or even 200 years. This tremendous growth uh, in the last 40 years, fueled obviously first by China uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, followed by India, uh, lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, as David mentioned, and led many to say that the century, the 21st century, is the Asian century, that the center of gravity of the economy or the world economy is shifting eastwards, and we have arrived. I think there are lots of challenges and bumps on that road. And what I want to do tonight is share with you some of those. Uh, Asia, indeed, has had a remarkable growth story. Uh, China has grown almost at about 10% uh, each year for the last three decades. India, about 8 to 9% over the last several years. But is that sustainable? And if it isn't, then what does have to happen for it to be so? I will talk about challenges that Asia has to face at the national level, regional level, and then at the global level. At the national level, I think the first challenge that Asia faces is one of rising inequality. Uh, we have all, of course, heard, as I just said, the tremendous growth story. Asians today are richer, they are healthier, they are more educated, they live longer, and it's a great success story. But what it hides at the same time is the fact that the rising tide of Asia's economic growth has not lifted all boats. 
Because, you see, that growth story is based on an assumption that all boats will rise with the rising tide, but that no boat has a hole in the hull. But indeed, if there is a hole in the hull, then those boats won't rise. And this has resulted in a situation in Asia where about 600 million people still are without access to clean water. 1.8 billion people in Asia are without access to improved sanitation. 20 million of children are not enrolled in primary school. And 83 million children under the age of five in developing Asia are underweight. Now, it's this last statistic which actually worries me the most. Because it means 83 million people, even before they've reached the age of five, are already condemned forever because they have been stunted in growth physically and intellectually. So this is an Asia which is as real as the bright one. This is the phenomenon of the two faces of Asia, both real but unfortunately diverging. Women and girls are uh, among Asia's most disadvantaged. Uh, more girls than boys are out of school in some countries. More girls than boys will not complete secondary education in some countries. More girls than boys will not live past their first birthday. More girls than boys will not live past their fifth birthday. But most worrying of all, more girls than boys will not be born. These are the challenges that Asia has to reckon with. That, we think, is the very first choice, very first challenge. And therefore, the growth story in Asia, which unfortunately is accompanied by an inequality story in Asia, needs to be contended with. The inequality in Asia, as measured by the Gini coefficient, is on the rise in almost every country. Very, very few exceptions. China, India, Thailand, Vietnam, you name it, we have a rising inequality. And the overall Gini coefficient in Asia has moved from 0.39 to 0.46 over the period 1995 to 2005. That's a significant deterioration of the equity situation. Now, one can argue or one should argue that rising inequality is a social justice issue. Inequality is an unacceptable state of human affairs. And before anybody says, but inequality is inevitable, let me say that I'm talking about inequality of opportunity, not of outcome. Yes, if somebody works harder, does better, she deserves to do better. I'm talking about inequality of opportunity as a result of gender, as a result of color, as a result of circumstances of birth, casteism in India, for example. So it's those inequalities of opportunities that I'm talking about. So I think society should worry about inequality as a social justice issue. But there is also an economic reason to worry about equality, inequality. And that is inequality dampens the growth process. Inequality acts as an attenuator on growth, and therefore, if you had the same growth process, but the income distribution did not worsen, you would actually have a greater impact on reducing poverty. We've done some econometric studies, and it shows that in Bangladesh, for example, the uh, poverty level would have been almost seven to eight percentage points lower if Bangladesh had the same growth as it did over the period 95 to 2005, but its income distribution did not worsen, which unfortunately did. And this is repeated in country after country, Laos or Indonesia, China or India, to varying degrees, but the fact remains that inequality is a dampener on growth and therefore is a dampener on reduction of poverty. So not only is inequality a social justice, a moral issue, 
it is also an economic issue. Therefore, there is no getting away that Asia cannot grow and then worry about inequality. Growth has to be inclusive. People must be able to participate in and benefit from that growth process. And therefore, a public policy choice has to be made about what growth pattern will the country follow. First, of course, you must have high growth. There's no question about it, because we are not talking about reducing inequality by income distribution. So you need growth, but you need, at the same time, simultaneously, two other things. You need efforts to increase the access to opportunity. You need access to opportunities through investments in health, investments in education. People have to be well enough, healthy enough, and skilled enough and educated enough to participate in the growth process. And simultaneously, there has to be a social safety net protection so that people who fall below it for reasons beyond their control aren't doomed because of a catastrophic illness or ill health. So a social safety net, access to opportunities, and high sustainable growth, these would be the three pillars of inclusiveness. The point is that governments in Asia have a choice. There's a public policy choice. You have to pursue growth, no question, but it has to be inclusive growth. Now, what is encouraging, I think, is that almost every country does consider inclusive growth as a very important part of its policy agenda. China, India, all the other countries as well. China, for example, very consciously now has decided that its growth process must move away from the coastal to the inner zones, must move away from the urban to the rural. In India, similarly, move away from the four large metropolises, move to the weaker states, emphasize infrastructure investments, which improves connectivity for these weaker areas so they can participate in the growth process. The Second uh, challenge that Asia faces, first being inclusive growth, is green growth, or the necessity of green growth. Asia, like many other places in the world, has followed the paradigm of grow now, clean later. That is unsustainable. And Asia is already paying the price for it. I don't have to give too many statistics uh, to a audience like this. But let me just mention that since 1990, for example, Asia's share in worldwide energy-related CO2 emissions has more than doubled. Without aggressive efforts towards low carbon growth, this share will rise to nearly half the global level by 2030. We have lost 40% of the coral reefs in the region. China is now the largest greenhouse gas emitter. India is following suit. In a situation like this, the environmentally unsustainable path that we're following will essentially and ultimately compromise growth itself. The demand for natural resources, which will come with a growth of even 7 to 8 percent, let alone the 10 percent growth we have seen, will make such demands on energy resources that we'll have to make sure they're efficiently used, we have to make sure that we use better technology, we have to make sure that there's innovation in climate change. The key thing being, key point being, that the alternative to green growth is not just less growth, it is probably going to be catastrophic and could result in some fairly dramatic damaging consequences. The longer we wait to adopt green growth as the preferred paradigm, the higher the cost of cleanup will be. Now, it is quite understandable that poor countries sometimes talk about, but the costs are so high. Our point is that the costs are going to be higher in the future. And it will compromise the sustainability of growth to an extent 
that they may become irrecoverable. And therefore, the choice that Asia has today is not to reduce growth, but to grow green. Some estimates show that the cost could be as high as $140, $175 billion a year by 2030. Yes, these are huge figures. But if you look at the bill of subsidies on fuel at a global level, that exceeds a trillion dollars. So from a global commons point of view, I think we've got to find ways to save the billion, trillion dollars that we use on fuel subsidies, which are in any case most of the time anti-poor and certainly anti-green, uh, and see if those cannot be used productively in reducing the costs of uh, going green at this stage. There is a understandable uh, pressure between the developed and the developing countries on who is going to be responsible for the state of affairs on the global warming. Our point is that neither the developed countries nor the developing countries by themselves can solve the problem. Let me again give some figures and uh, as any figures, these are subject to some errors, but they're certainly within the range of acceptability. We did some econometric modeling work showing that if nobody did anything, neither the developed world nor the developing, the world would be 4.9 degrees centigrade warmer by 2100. And it doesn't really matter if it's off by a point here, a point there. We're going to be cooked anyways. <laughs> but if the developed countries only, the Annex I uh, countries on the Kyoto Protocol, were to follow their commitments under the Kyoto Protocol, which I must say that the reasons to believe that it may not happen, uh, which means that they are committed to reduce their emissions by 80% from 1990 levels by 2050. Suppose they do it. The global warming will come down, but only to 4.4 degrees. So 4.9 degrees if nobody does anything, 4.4 degrees if only the Annex I countries, i.e. the developed countries, take action as committed under the Kyoto Protocol. Not very significant. But... If the developing countries, if the emerging economies of China and India and Brazil and Mexico and Argentina, the, the, the emerging economies of the world, if they too were to take actions to mitigate their uh, or reduce their carbon footprint and, for example, agreed to hold their emissions at 2005 levels by 21, 2050, and reduce their deforestation by 90% compared to their 1990 level. Then, dramatic impact. The combined effect of both these actions by the Annex I countries and the emerging economies will result in a global warming of only 2.7 degrees. And I think it will not be too difficult to appreciate that therefore it's in the global interest, including the interests of the developing countries, including certainly of Asia, to have to come to some sort of an agreement on how to make this happen. I think we don't have a choice. Under a business as usual scenario, the sea levels will rise by about 46 centimeters by the end of the century. And of the 20 cities which are identified as being the most vulnerable uh, for the population which live in those cities, 15 of those cities are going to be in Asia. So as I say, that if I were a Bangladeshi grandfather and I'm drowning with my grandson because of the sea rise, the only comfort I suppose I could draw is to be able to say to my grandson, 
just remember, child, this wasn't my fault. And presumably, an American grandmother would do the same to her granddaughter. But the bottom line is that we'll all be drowning. So the challenge for us at a global level is to recognize the importance of green growth and that we believe that green growth is affordable and we do not in Asia, for that matter anywhere else, have a choice of growing now and greening later. Growing now and cleaning later is not an option. So therefore, it has to be a simultaneous process. Let me quickly mention three other challenges that Asia faces uh, in uh, making sure that it has a sustainable growth. One uh, is inclusiveness or lack of it. Second is greening or lack of it. Third is coping with urbanization. In the next 40 years, the urban population in Asia will almost double from 1.6 billion to 3.1 billion. Uh, cities will become the epicenter of economic life, higher education, innovation, and technological development. This is on the plus side, but on the negative side, it will make huge demands on services, municipal services. It will make huge demand on governance. It will be obviously a major source of energy consumption and carbon emissions, and therefore will put added pressure both on the carbon footprint and the energy requirements. Uh, urbanization will obviously also lead to an increase in environmental risks associated with natural disasters and other effects of climate change. But this is inevitable. The rural to urban migration is ongoing. China became more urban than rural in 2011. And this trend is apparent and obvious throughout. So therefore, Asia will need to adopt a new approach to urbanization by building more compact and eco-friendly and resilient cities. We'll have to make sure that the governance structures in the cities are able to cope with this transfer of population. But this is a major challenge which Asia faces. The fourth challenge for Asia is financial. Despite our vast financial savings uh, in Asia, we save roughly about 34% of our GDP. Uh, our financial markets are not broad enough or deep enough to intermediate those savings into regional needs. So our savings make their way to Wall Street or London or some other capital markets and make their way back into, back into Asia. The only way that the growth process in Asia will be sustainable if the financial markets are able to cope with the savings volume and intermediate them into regional investments as required. We will therefore have to make sure that we have a financial sector which goes beyond just the banking as institutions. We need capital markets which can intermediate investments in infrastructure, in climate change, in urbanization, and as well as technological development and business creation. Obviously, inclusive finance, which is microfinance as an example, would be important. Lack of an adequate financial sector is, we believe, a major challenge facing Asia in its pursuit of sustainable growth. Education, entrepreneurship, and innovation. We believe that uh, Asia certainly has increased significantly the quantity of education. But the quality of education is far from satisfactory. India, for example, produces 250,000 engineers a year, only a quarter of which are employable by international standards. We will therefore, over the next 40, 50 years, require the harnessing of the full potential of technology, innovation, and critically, entrepreneurship. The model in Asia so far 
and what's probably not a bad model to begin with, was essentially playing catch up. Basically updating the technologies developed elsewhere, adapting it to the market, and taking it a step forward. We do not think that is adequate anymore. Asian countries, we believe, will need to emulate Japan or Singapore or Korea and come closer to, or preferably become, the global best practice. We have to find ways by which we add intellectual content to production, which we don't do at the moment. Yes, we do assemble iPads in Asia, but only four cents of every dollar of revenue of iPad stays in Asia. The rest is basically part of the logistics, part of the intellectual property, and these are fair. I mean, I'm not complaining, but I'm saying that we have to be able to start designing iPads as much as assembling iPads. And therefore, in that context, the quality of education, quality of innovation, must become key drivers of economic development in the region. And sixth, and I'm putting it last, not because it's the least important, perhaps in a way, it is the most important, improving governance. And when I say governance, I'm not talking only about corruption. Of course, corruption, fighting it, it has to be the topmost priority. Corruption is a tax on the poor, is very anti-poor, is a cancer on society, and there can be no other way to deal with it frontally. But governance is more than just corruption. Good governance is about institutions, is about accountability, is about making sure that there are rules and regulations, there is predictability in those rules and regulations, and most importantly, that they're applied. Implementation is as important as having the rules in the first place. Let me distract you just for a moment and mention two Sanskrit words which I think really captures what I'm trying to get at. Very simple. Uh, first word is niti, N-I-T-I. And niti, other word is nyai, N-Y-A-Y-A. Both words in Sanskrit roughly mean justice. But there is a very important nuance difference, actually. Niti refers to rules and regulations. Very important. You have to have the rules and you have to have the regulations. These refer to organizational principles, behavioral correctness, Nyai refers to realized justice. Nyai recognizes the role of niti in shaping institutional framework, in shaping the rules and regulations, but then recognizes the reality in its application. So you can have all the niti in the world, but if you don't have nyai, then you don't have good governance. In Asia, over the last several decades, we have gone some distance in getting the niti in place. Difficult, but in almost all countries, we now have rules and regulations. We have a land law. We basically have regulations on disputes. We have dispute resolution mechanisms in place. What we need to have is nyai. It has to be implemented. We have to have not only courts, which is the niti, but we have to have courts which can dispense justice rapidly and, of course, fairly. Let me throw in another Sanskrit word, uh, which is slightly longer. It's called matsanyai, M-A-T-S-Y-A. Matsya means fish. Matsanyai basically is justice in the world of the fish. And you know what the justice in the world of the fish is? Very simple. The big fish eat up the small fish. We cannot have 
matsanei in any of these societies. And matsanei is a big challenge in Asia. The elite capture the power, elite are the big fish, and that transforms or translates into matsanei. So we are looking for good governance, and as I said, it is much broader than just uh, corruption. Corruption is obviously a very important element of this, but it's not enough. In Niai, we are willing to do what is called partial ordering. We cannot have a perfect society. We know we'll never get there, but we can recognize patent injustices, and we can recognize, for example, that if there is a niti, a rule about universal primary education, particularly for the girl child, we can say, great, we've done it. We have got now universal primary education, and now everything will follow. I believed that myself. And many years back, in the euphoria of this knowledge of Niti and the arrogance and ignorance of youth, I proceeded to do a project in Nepal for girls' education, armed with all the tools in my kit. I visited a village, uh, spent a weekend there, and at night, I proudly uh, declared to the village headman that after centuries or maybe millennium of problems in this village on girls' education, I have arrived to solve it, because now we'll have a girls' school in his village, uh, fully expecting him to be very grateful for this news. He looked at me and he said, uh, good, uh, so when are you going to put a water supply project in this village? And I said, of course, this man hadn't understood what I said, so I repeated again that I was talking about a girls' school. And he, of course, repeated that he wanted a water supply project. It was only later in the evening when I reflected a bit, since I realized he was actually serious, that I realized what a wise man he was and how foolish I was. He was basically telling me about Nei. He was telling me that, look, if you want to get the girl child to school, first help her not having to walk seven hours a day to fetch a pail of water, which is what she does. So if you want to get her to school, give her a water supply project so that she can then walk only maybe seven minutes and then go to school. This is governance. This is good governance in which you talk about nea. You, you talk about an imperfect society. We're not going to change everything because one can get into a hole and a very relevant argument. Why is it the girl child who's walking seven hours? What about the boy? The boy is probably sleeping. Uh, but we will not get into that at the moment because, as I said, we're talking about partial ordering. Take a set, and it is that challenge of good governance of Nei. And, of course, you'll recognize that all of this is work of Professor Amartya Sen, uh, and, and I'm just sort of taking his hugely important contribution to the subject and encapsulating in, in just a few words. So these we believe are the challenges, inclusive growth, green growth, urbanization, financial sector, education, and governance at the national level. Then at the regional level, Asia needs to have much more cooperation, hopefully more integration, but I don't think we'll be talking about integration a la EU. I don't think we'll have a centric, Eurocentric or Asia-centric. I don't think we'll have a United States of Asia anytime soon. But I think there has to be much greater cooperation, much greater integration, much greater trade between the countries in the region. And it has to be open regionalism. It cannot be at the cost of others. It cannot be a fortress Asia, but an Asia. And the last level at which Asia needs to face these challenges is going to be at the global level. If Asia is going to grow and grow to be a major economic power in the region, and some estimates Asia could by 2050 account for 52% of the global GDP, 
up from 27% now. It's plausible, but not preordained. If that were to happen, Asia also has to take the global responsibilities that will come with it, be it in the global environment scene, global uh, public commons, but Asia needs to step up to the plate at the global table. Can these happen? We believe so, it can, that Asia is up to the task. But these are the challenges we feel that Asia faces in making sure that indeed it can enjoy sustainable growth, which means growth which can continue for a long period. And if it does, then the so-called Asian century might come to pass. But I have to immediately also put on record that I don't believe in the term Asian century. I think it will be a century which will be a global century at, in which Asia will indeed have a role to play, but so will the others. It is a connected world in which either it's everybody's centuries or nobody's at all. Thank you very much. Well, Roger, let me begin by thanking you for that very, very comprehensive and very, very insightful uh, overview of the development issues and challenges confronting the region. Uh, one term that didn't appear in your talk, that does appear in several of the ADB publications looking out to the future, is the term middle income trap. And uh, if I understood correctly, your outlook to 2050, you see about 11 countries in the region that are uh, potentially vulnerable to falling into this trap. I'd, I'd like to ask, uh, first of all, what is the middle income trap? And what can the governments of those countries do to avoid it? Great. Um, the middle income trap is basically a phenomenon, David, in which Countries grow for a while and then find they can't compete with countries above them because they are not innovative enough or skilled enough. Uh, so they can't design the iPad, but they're assembling the iPad. But they also can't compete with countries below them because their wage rates have gone up. So now they can't just you know, make shoes or assemble garments. So you get caught in the middle income trap at incomes around 10,000 or so. And this has happened. I mean, Brazil is a case in point. Philippines, where we live, is a case in point. Now, we think that if the countries don't take care of the six things that I said and the regional uh, and global issues that I mentioned, they could get caught in the middle income trap. And I should say that anybody can, though we've said some are more vulnerable than others, this could easily be China or India because nobody's out of that range as yet. Human capital, you've alluded to the need for education, for innovation, right. for entrepreneurship. Um, say a little bit more about uh, the role that education has played in terms of fueling the growth that we've seen so far in Asia, but the kind of qualitative change that you've alluded to, what is it gonna take for that kind of uh, reform to happen? And how do you see education and human capital playing out in terms of the future growth and development scenario in, in the region? I think, David, in Asia, we will have to go up the value chain in human capital, which is basically we've got to become much more innovative. We've got to do much better in sciences and technology uh, in terms of designing. We have followed a mostly uh, Japan, Korea, these are obviously exceptions. Uh, we have followed a model of quantity rather than quality. And this, quite frankly, was not inappropriate for the level of growth we were in. We wanted to get the manufacturing up. This is the basis of the newly industrial economies uh, that did it so well. So basically, get some skills, get manufacturing going, 
and sell it to the uh, Western world. That won't do anymore. So now you will have to get innovative, got to be able to design and invest heavily in research and development, which is what the Korean model is. So not only just assemble TVs, design TVs, and then make it the best practice in the world. And that's going to be the major next challenge for Asia. Um, urbanization, mm -hmm. which you've uh, alluded to as one of the key factors right. and uh, Asia becoming a more highly urbanized uh, society. Are there any sort of success stories or models out there that sort of suggest how urbanization can be uh, uh, accommodated in ways that are environmentally sensitive, are um, sort of responsive to the, the um, uh, kind of uh, both the um, uh, income distribution challenge that you've alluded to and the green growth challenge? You know, uh, unfortunately, we don't have that many examples in Asia. We have many examples where we've got it all wrong, uh, including the city that I live in and the city that I come from. Uh, and the city that I frequently visit. So, uh, but having said that, uh, Tokyo, I think, is a great example where there's been excellent urban planning. Uh, Singapore uh, and Seoul uh, increasingly. Now, one would immediately counter by saying, but these are already advanced economies, therefore they can afford it. I think this is a chicken and egg story. I think we will have to get our urban scene much, much better if we're going to have sustainable growth. We can't afford to have a Delhi or a Gurgaon or a Jakarta or a Manila and then say we'll clean later. It has to be a simultaneous process. But as I said, uh, uh, Asia can be proud of many things, but certainly not its cities. And every time I come to San Francisco, I envy you even more <laughs> in spite of the rain. There's been a lot of focus on the phenomenon of microfinance right. and microenterprise. Um, as an economist and someone who uh, labors in the development vineyard, what's your perspective and view about the role of microfinance, the limitations on this as an instrument? Um, and as we think our way forward, and you've alluded to the importance of developing uh, the financial services sector, uh, you know, where does microfinance fit in, in, that, uh, in that overall scenario? David, uh, unequivocally, I should say, I'm a great believer in microfinance. I think it has done and is an agent of a lot of good. Uh, there have been some implementation problems. And recently, microfinance has taken a hit uh, in India, in Bangladesh. But I think the, cons the handling of it was more like throwing the baby out with the bath. The problem with microfinance in India has been not with the philosophy, but with the problem of identification of beneficiaries. And therefore, many beneficiaries have actually taken microfinance loans from more than one microfinance entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And there was not enough due diligence in the uh, screening of the applicants. Uh, that has to be done, obviously. Uh, we will need a much better system of identification of microfinance beneficiaries. But microfinance as an instrument, I think, is a very critical element uh, to break the cycle of poverty in, in most of the countries in Asia. We have a, a couple of questions here about in the uh, green growth area. One uh, related to alternative energy development, solar power, hydro, geothermal, what, in your view, is the potential for development of these alternative energy sources as a, as a growing and important part of the green growth strategy of uh, several Asian economies? I think the potential is huge. I mean, China is a major uh, innovator and proponent of solar and wind, and so is India, and you're seeing some huge production of uh, solar and wind energy in, in these countries. Uh, so I think we should certainly as extensively and expansively as possible push for renewables. Uh, but there are two factors. One is the cost. Now cost will come down, of course, as the uh, scale increases. But we should also be very realistic. In Asia, 
800 million people still do not have access to electricity. 1.8 billion people still burn biomass as their primary fuel source. So for them to say, look, go renewable or don't go anything at all is not acceptable, it's not viable. Therefore, I think we've got to look at all the options. We've got to have renewables, but also the non-renewables. We've got to have thermal power generation. We've got to therefore have to burn coal. I know that's going to be, oh my God, how can we burn coal? But it has to be clean coal or cleaner coal. I think this debate must be in a very non-dogmatic way, look at the options and try to make it as clean as possible. Not producing electricity in most places is not an option. We have a, a question about China. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the question here is twofold, really. First of all, how does China's growing economic influence uh, affect the work of the ADB as an institution? And second, uh, overall, do you see China as a positive force or a negative force in terms of some of the key uh, issues and challenges that you see for the region's future development? I think uh, China, just about ADB, uh, its uh, growing uh, economic uh, force is a very welcome thing for ADB because we then expect China to be able to play a role in due course as a donor, as contributing to the development of the region, as providing resources. Uh, and it serves as, a, as an example of how growth can indeed lead to poverty reduction. I think one cannot take away from the fact that Chinese experience of reducing poverty of hundreds of million is something that obviously has made a big difference in Asia. I think China, positive or negative, is going to depend not only on China, but the rest of the world, how it engages with China. And I think we have to, at least in ADB, we're trying to get them to the table in all the discussions on the Chinese growth model itself i.e. make it more inclusive, i.e. make it more green uh, governance. Uh, and the Chinese might, economic might, is a fact. And I think it's a question of all of us dealing with it in the most positive way. And I should say India. China and India are going to be the two major drivers, not only for Asian economy, but for the global economy. And we've got to make sure that they are part of the process rather than outside it. We, we have a question again on China from one of our high school students who's joined uh -huh. us here, and that has to do with the, uh, uh, the uh, issue of human rights. Uh, and the question is, the Chinese activist Ai Weiwei and, uh, said that Chinese economic boom would come at the sacrifice of human rights. Do you believe that China will start to, fa to um, factor in human rights when um, developing its economic policies for growth? I think any development always has costs and benefits. When you build a hydropower project, for example, you, have, you displace people. But what I think is important is how do you deal with those who are displaced? In every ADB project, we have very, very strict and very well laid out social safeguard policies which have to be complied with, whether it's in China or India or Vietnam or anywhere. And we ensure that it is. So therefore, in that sense, having China engaged with international organizations such as ours forces them, enables them, requires them to uphold the best standards, which is then to the benefit of everybody. Um, you've talked about the importance of good governance, and uh, this question has, uh, poses the, the challenge of the differences, the pros and cons between more democratic and less democratic states in terms of their ability to actually cope with and address some of the main economic development challenges that you've identified. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what political system a people choose, that has to be their choice. Good governance, I think, is independent of the political system. Good governance, Niti and Nayai talking about respect for the people who are sort of, you know, left out of the process of development, corruption or the lack of it, I think is what we are talking about. What political system a country will choose will have to be left to them. And I think as an international organization, or maybe even for that matter, outsiders, I think we cannot and should not get involved with that. 
Um, this question relates to the U.S. role mm -hmm. in all of this, and mm -hmm. the and the the issue is really the question is, what role do you think the United States can or should be playing in Asia over the next ten years, particularly in addressing the challenges that you've mentioned in your uh, remarks this evening? Mm -hmm. I, I think. Uh, U.S. Uh, does play and should play a very important role. It's a principal shareholder in the ADB, and in that context itself has a very important role to play. But even if I just take out of the context of ADB, I think uh, the administration's pivot towards Asia is an extremely sensible uh, move. Uh, after all, it recognizes the fact that the center of gravity of the economic powers is shifting eastwards, and U.S. must be a part of it. U.S. must be a part of it to support Asia, but also benefit from it. I think it's a, it's a mutually reinforcing process. And therefore, I would hope very much that the USA will stay very engaged in Asia. Um, one of our uh, audience members asked the question about the population issue yeah. and uh, why there is not more focus on contraception to cope with the uh, population growth problem and how do you overcome the resistance from religious and cultural beliefs which impede uh, efforts at, at, uh, at uh, uh, family planning? Uh, I'll address that question, David, at two levels. Uh, one, I think the most important thing is education. Uh, uh, education of the girl child does much more for uh, better family population control, the whole host of activities which an educated mother, a healthy mother and an educated mother can make. So I think we believe that, again, as an international organization, that we sh need to focus on the education, particularly of the girl child. I should, having said that, also say that as an international organization, we are apolitical. Our owners are very political. Uh, and, and, of course, that debate, therefore, has to happen at their, at their level. Uh, but population by itself is not the issue. I think it will be simplistic to say high population equates to more problems. It's the question of the demographics. It's the question of the skill level. India's population is a challenge. But at the same time, India's population being a young population, median age being about 25, is actually a huge potential for it. Uh, but it depends on whether that education is skilled and able to participate in the growth process. If it is not, then the population dividend, demographic dividend, will become a demographic curse. So it's not just the population, right. it's the attributes of that population which matter. Um, we have a couple of questions about the bank itself. First of all, could you give some examples of some very successful projects that have been supported by the Asian Development Bank? Um, and uh, then a specific question about what the ADB is doing in Pakistan and to the extent of uh, specifically around governance and equity issues in Pakistan. Right. You know, in Ottawa, where I was just before coming, the first part of the question was asked, but then I was also asked, give an example of a project Disaster. you failed. Disaster. And I was sort of waiting for that question. But I'll, actually, to be fair, I'll answer that as well. So okay. I know you didn't ask, but I think it's only fair that... Uh, I think a very successful project uh, for us uh, it was the Jamuna Bridge project in Bangladesh. Uh, not because it was a big bridge, but because I think that bridge, which we financed together with the World Bank in the late 80s, early 90s, was the best poverty reduction project we ever did in that country. All the poverty reduction projects at the micro level pale in comparison to what happened when the Jamuna Bridge was completed and the eastern part of the country was connected to the western part. Farmers in the northwestern part could bring their chicken and their eggs and their produce to Dhaka, sell and go back. And what was essentially a, what one would call a run-of-the-mill infrastructure project turned out to be, in my mind, an extremely important poverty reduction project and a successful one. Where we failed was when we failed to recognize the effects of the project. We did a project in Laos. Uh, we were all very convinced this was a good hydropower project. It generated electricity. It had the right economics. It had the right finance. It exported power to Thailand for a very impoverished country like Laos. That was very important. 
Uh, we brought in the private sector, so the public-private partnership was important. What we failed miserably to do, and we learned our lessons from that, was we did not consult adequately with the affected people, so we didn't talk enough with the fishermen. So we built a dam, we, you know, everything was fine, till of course there was first little fish and there was no fish downstream and the fishermen were affected. And once the fish are gone, they are gone. And to correct that was very costly in terms of the human impact. And that was a lesson that we seared into our, our uh, <laughs> genes, as it were, how not doing adequate preparation on the environmental side, social impact of projects can, can, be, can be bad. In Pakistan, uh, again, uh, I'm not trying to duck the question at all. Uh, I really believe that as outsiders, and we, no matter how much empathy we have for a country, we are outsiders. When it comes to governance, justice, we can only do so much as the country does or the country wants or the country can. So yes, in Pakistan, we have worked very closely on uh, social justice. As a matter of fact, your country director in Pakistan, who was also our <laughs> staff, did a fantastic job on access to justice. We supported the Supreme Court to see if we can, by bringing in IT, lessen the load. We have established green judges in a green bench in, in Pakistan. Uh, these are all contributions. Does it really result in ultimately more justice in society or greater equity? I cannot tell. Uh, and that, I think, is because we are outsiders and we are only a part of the process but cannot drive the process. Um, Follow-on question to that, uh, in, a, in a way, asks about what the ADB is doing to actually listen to and meet the development needs of local populations. Uh, they actually picked up on your uh, example of the girls' school versus the water project right. uh, dilemma. How, you know, given the the limitations that you've described in terms of the the member governments vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the bank. How does, what mechanisms does the bank use to really um, ensure that the projects that it's supporting are indeed responsive to local needs right. and priorities? Right. Well, I mean, as I mentioned, our experience in Laos was a seeding experience and we realized how important it is to talk to the affected people and these are now part of our policy. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we as an institution have decided on some strategic priorities for us in terms of our comparative advantage. So instead of being an institution, yes to everything, we have said we will do only projects in the five following areas, infrastructure, education, finance, environment, regional cooperation. But that does not mean we'll go to every country and say, well, here are those five and here are these five projects. We will have an intersection of what we can do well with what the country needs. So if the country does not need an education project, say in this case in Nepal, then obviously we won't do it. So it's an intersection of what we can do and what the country wants. And this is reflected, David, in an exercise we undertake every two to three years called the country partnership strategy. And then we modify it every year based on this dialogue. But it's an iterative process uh, because sitting in Manila or sitting in Dhaka or in you know, Delhi, you design the best projects that there ever was, and you go to the ground and you realize that you got it all wrong. Like I had a girl's school in mind and ended up doing a rural <laughs> water supply project. Uh, ultimately we did, we changed it so dramatically that we actually did a rural water supply project in Nepal uh, and didn't do the girls' project at all, a girls' education so you project. you did listen. We did listen. In this particular case, I had no choice. The, the village headman was very clear what he wanted. Um, I'm sorry, we're going to, because of time, I, I think this will need to be our last uh, question. And, and it's really uh, asking you about your opinion of a recent book by Walden Bellow uh, called The Dragons, Dragons in Distress. It's associated with the Center for the Global South, which really right. critiques globalization's race to the bottom. Um, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for Walden and I know him and that's a view. Uh, my uh, quarrel, not with Walden, but with that debate is, so what's the option? Uh, 
to say not to do something is also a choice and there are consequences of it. So to a family which can't feed its children, can't send their children to school, and don't have means of any productive employment, to say keep things in its pristine beauty in its bucolic sort of setting is one option, but it has consequences. So that's my quarrel with that school. On the other hand, I, as I mentioned in my lecture, am a firm believer that you just can't grow and grow and grow. It has to be sustainable. So I'm not talking about quantity of growth, but quality of growth. But not growing at all is not an option and has very serious consequences. And therefore, this is not a binary decision. It is a complex decision which reflects the sort of challenges I talked about. Um, this concludes our program uh, this evening. Um, I want to, uh, on behalf of all of us, express our thanks and, and uh, sincere appreciation, Rajat, to you for, I think, offering a very thoughtful and nuanced perspective on some of the growth and development challenges facing Asia today and over the, the next uh, several decades. And I'd invite uh, the audience uh, to join me in expressing our appreciation for your remarks. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you.